What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Ableton Music Producer Podcast. Today's episode is really unique. I got to hang out with Roddy Kirk, who happens to be the Director of Product and Education at the company Melodics. If you've been listening to this podcast already, I have been repping Melodics for the last 15 to 20 episodes. It's a great company. They have a desktop app that you can download and plug in nearly any MIDI controller, whether it's a push two for finger drumming or a MIDI keyboard or an electronic drum set. And the app helps you grow your skills playing that instrument. But today we're gonna talk a lot about the psychology behind what it means to become a better learner. Roddy shares some really interesting aspects of how people can learn more quickly and the studies that he's done in music education. Really good episode, super nice guy. And before we jump into today's episode, I wanted to let you know if you haven't signed up for the newsletter already, I definitely encourage you to check that out. If you want to get notified when episodes first come out before anybody else, just go to liveproducersonline.com slash newsletter. You'll stay notified with new webinars, Ableton trainings, other things to help step up your skills in the studio on stage, and you'll be notified with new episodes as they're happening. Also excited to share that I'm updating my intro to Ableton music production course um, with the new features of Ableton Live 11 that are coming soon. So if you are considering joining the membership or if you feel like you're stuck in your productions, you just want to learn some new skills and connect with the community, you can join the Connect membership or the Pro membership will give you access to all the courses. But the Connect membership that I'm doing every week, it's just kind of a family group hangout and we pick a topic in the private Facebook group that you guys vote on and then we talk about it and I share my own projects and workflows and how I am producing in Ableton Live. Now is the best time to join, the price is gonna go up. So if you're interested in that, go to liveproducersonline.com, click the fat green join button on the homepage and um, join the membership. would love to see you on the other side. If you don't own the latest version of Ableton Live, if you purchase it now, you'll get a free upgrade to the equivalent version when Live 11 comes out, which is pretty soon. And I would be glad to hook you up with a discount. Just go to liveproducersonline.com slash buy Ableton, liveproducersonline.com slash buy Ableton. I'd be glad to hook you up with a discount and you'll get a free upgrade to 11 when it comes out. Fun fact, if you purchased Ableton Live 10 after November 10th of 2020, then you automatically should get a free upgrade to 11 when it comes out soon. Thanks for listening to the podcast, everybody. Uh, Be sure to leave a review and like, subscribe, wherever your listening preferences for the podcast. I would super appreciate it. And now for today's episode with Roddy Kirk. Uh, Today, we have a special guest from the company Melodics, which I've been repping on the podcast for a while now. They make some great software teaching you how to practice your skills on a keyboard or finger drumming. I'm sure you've heard lots of shout outs about them in previous episodes. Roddy is actually the director of product and education at Melodics. uh, So we're lucky to hang out with him today. He's also the founder of Studio Psalms, uh, where he has previously done production, sound design, film scoring with clients, including Gatorade, Melodics, obviously. Uh, He's also been featured on several different tutorials on Ableton.com, sharing his awesome push tutorials, which I binge watched today. And uh, I picked up a couple things. So yeah, you're definitely a wizard on the push and uh, the push one, actually. You have a lot of videos on that one, the legacy push back in the day. But thanks, man, for hanging out. It's good to have you on the podcast. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Gosh, the uh, push one stuff really does take me back a little bit, right? That would have been uh, good like seven seven years ago or so now. Yeah. Yeah. Good old days, man. Um, but you're working at Melodics right now. You're in Berlin, right? Speaking of the Ableton family, probably right down the street from them. I'm, I'm, I'm in New Zealand right now. Oh, Melodic, sorry. Melodic, sorry. Is, yes. Nice. They, they, we're based in New Zealand, um, but uh, we do have, I used to be living in Berlin for, for a long time, and we do have some uh, of our team based in Berlin still as well. Right. So we're kind, of, we're kind of split. We're mostly all in New Zealand now, um, but there's still one or two uh, of us in Berlin. Cool. Awesome. Yeah, actually, I read online that New Zealand 
is a pretty affordable, great place to live right now, considering the economy is happening and the pandemic and everything. I, I read an article about like New Zealand apparently is a great place to purchase like a second house. A lot of really wealthy people actually purchase homes to live out there in the middle of nowhere. I thought it was kind of interesting. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I, I, I grew up here, so it's not like a, it's not like an escape um, bunker for, for, for me. Uh, what, what happened um, with, uh, with my family and I was that, uh, you know, my wife and I um, uh, went, went to Berlin with uh, a couple of backpacks and came back with uh, two kids and an apartment full of shit. So um, like shipping container full of full of an apartment. So um, yeah. that was really like the, um, the main motivation for, uh, for us to move back here uh, a few years ago. But um, since then, you know, uh, COVID's happened and right. uh, we're, we're actually just really lucky to be that geographically isolated that we've been relatively insulated from it so far. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that where they filmed Lord of the Rings too? It's absolutely beautiful there. I'm a little bit jealous, to be honest. I live in a very flat climate in Indiana. There's like nothing here except for just corn. It's about it. If you like corn, it's a great place to live. Yeah, no, it's it's absolutely beautiful here. I mean, like you know, I'm I'm in an office with a with a bunch of post-it notes at the moment, so you can't really uh, see much of it. But you know, every every morning on my way in, I'm uh, I'm catching catching a um a boat, so I, I take take a ferry across uh, across the harbor, and uh, yeah, it is, it's a really beautiful place to live. Nice, nice. So, how did you get involved at Melodics? Like, how did that come about? How did you get involved in the company? Well. Uh, I've known the, the founder, Sam Gribben. He's the old uh, CEO of Serato. And I've known him, uh, you know, Serato is one of the one of the sort of leading music tech companies uh, to come out of New Zealand. And uh, so I've, I've known him really from back in the day because my background's in DJing. And uh, I know him through that. And um, around the time he was starting Melodics, so in uh, 2015 or so, um, I was working at a university in Berlin, teaching um, music production and developing courses around um, around music. And it was all it was all very much based in um, what I'd call like project based learning, or you know, active learning, or just le learning by doing rather than uh, being told. Um, and so, uh, I, I was back in New Zealand for for a, for a visit, and um, he gave me, gave me a call, and uh, we, we met up, and we talked a little bit about what we were up to, and uh, I was just really excited by the possibilities, um, even in like the very early idea stage of Melodics, that would just allow people to, um, you know, learn an instrument through playing that instrument, and to get a very direct feedback loop and also to learn it in a way um, that sort of used, you know, music in the real world that, um, that they were familiar with. So, um, you know, like just starting from day one by um, learning music uh, with like, you know, hip hop or house music or techno or kind of whatever you're into. So um, you take a lot of that learning um, that you already have. So you're not starting from zero, you know, you're already familiar with the, the conventions of the kind of music that you're into. Um, and so I found that really powerful. So, in uh, so I started doing a little bit of um, ideation work and some some of the demos of the first lessons when I was uh, you know I went back to Berlin and started working on that. And then um, the company started to take off, and I and I ended up leaving the university and and coming to work with Melodics. And I was based out of Berlin doing that for a while, and then. About two years ago, made the move um, with my family back to New Zealand, and it's been uh, it's been kind of like that ever since. We're um, we're, we're back here and, and really loving it, and the company's um, you know growing and, and doing well. And it's kind of nice to see that there is now in New Zealand like a bit of a you know healthy uh, music technology ecosystem. It's really nice, you know this. Um, there's quite a few, you know, young people at, at Melodics and like those kind of um, opportunities kind of didn't, didn't really uh, exist as, as much when I was younger, which was a big part of the reason for us to uh, move overseas in the first place. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, Melodics is a great company just from what I know and through the email threads I've been through with you guys. And um, just even trying out the software for the first time, I think was like three and a half years ago for me. And... At first, I was kind of like, oh, this is like a Guitar Hero, but better. 
And, and like, even more so than that, I'm sure you probably hate hearing that analogy. I'm sure people have said that before, but it's, I mean, it's really customizable to the user in the sense of like what you're doing with education. I don't see anybody else really doing like right now on this kind of scale, as far as taking my existing MIDI controller, maybe it's my push to, for example, cause we both love these, right. Um, and just being able to plug it in and just being able to use what I have to grow my skills on that certain controller when it comes to making music. I don't know any other company other than Melodics right now that is doing what you guys are doing in that sense. Um, that is also providing like a wide genre and range of, of lessons and tutorials for people to practice. That's like in an interest or genre that they're interested in. Um, like, you know, for Guitar Hero, for example, like it was all 80s hair metal rock bands. <laughs> like, you know, and that's all you got. Like, and it wasn't actually like playing guitar. People actually felt like they were guitarists when they weren't. But you guys have like a professional market that you're really reaching to and helping people produce and write and grow their skills and playing scales. Like for me, I've used some of your keyboard lessons on the MIDI controller, just like growing my skills and my fingering. That's like one example of the many lessons you guys have. So you're doing great things. That's a really cool story about like, you know, you just getting involved. There's a lot of young people at the company. It seems like the company's doing really well. Um, I know another thing that you were involved in last year was you were supposed to speak at Loop, but clearly that got canceled with everything else in the world. Um, maybe just talk a little bit about what you're going to share for Loop, because I was supposed to be there. It's pretty disappointed, but I would have loved to hear you speak. Right, yeah, we could have been doing this in real life. I mean, yeah, it's obviously it's a shame that loop the loop was cancelled. I've I've really enjoyed the last uh, few loop events. I think I've actually been to to all of them at this stage, and I've I've taken a lot away from uh, from each one, yeah. and met some you know amazing people from all around the world. I think that's like it's actually my favorite thing that uh, that. Uh, that Ableton uh, does at the moment is um, is this is this loop event. I think that's probably in the last um, few years what I've personally taken the most um, most away from out of all of their different products. Yeah. Um, so yeah, what I what I was going to talk about in uh, loop twenty twenty, I was going to talk about the um, about practice and the kind of art and science behind practice you know like what is good practice and um how do we consider it you know like a big part of of my job here at melodics is just thinking about like what makes good practice and how to um how to build that into the product like a big part of that is obviously um you know making practice fun uh which is something we spend a lot of effort on which is also why i don't really mind the um guitar hero comparisons stuff because like really like that's fun, right? And the more um, and the more you can sort of um, the more you can sort of engage those kind of motivational mechanics to help you push through tough spots, um, the better. As far as I'm concerned, you know, most people start learning an instrument and then uh, drop off really quickly because they feel like they're not making any progress and they're not having any fun doing it because it is, you know, just not fun when you start out doing something and you're not um, you're not very good at it. Yeah. So what I was going to talk about was, um, yeah, I think I called the talk like the art and science of, uh, of practice. And there's kind of two real um, threads to that. So um, the science is kind of like how practice works and like sort of looking at um, some of the neurology behind that. So um yeah, I'll uh, know more about that. A little bit. Like there's a there's a kind of insulating fatty protein called myelin, which um, which connects these um, uh, neural pathways in, in your brain. And what happens is the, the connections that you make will get sort of insulated by this um, by this uh, protein, and they'll become stronger over time. So just by repeating that connection, you kind of further strengthen the, um, the ties between it, which is why it's so important to do stuff like, um, sorry, like to give an example, if someone were to like throw a ball at you, you'd kind of catch it automatically without having to think about it too much because that kind of, um, that reaction sort of being, being built up over time and being, right. um, being insulated. Yeah. And so that, that's the thing when like um, l learning a new skill, it's, uh, it's important to, you know, do things like, 
slow down your actions and you know um, make sure you're, um, you're you're getting it right because otherwise you're um, you're insulating um, the the wrong uh, the wrong paths in your in your, in your mind. Um, so if you're like able to slow it down, even though it feels kind of brutal, you are kind of building up that insulation correctly and it can kind of um, speed up. That's also why, you know, and, you know, it's a total double-edged sword, right? So if you're like, you can, you, you can insulate um, bad connections as well as good ones. Um, so just, just kind of being aware of that. And like, this is a very ad hoc kind of uh, improv approach to, uh, to the topic, but thinking about, um, you know, just how the mind works and how, how practice, um, uh, how the science of practice can, can, the more you understand about this, this sort of stuff, the, um, I think the more um, of an active role you can take in your own, uh, in your own learning and in your own practice. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, they have that old saying, like practice makes perfect. Right. And from a neurological standpoint, you kind of just proved that i mean it just, the more you do something the better you get at it but but also being able to to gamify the process uh i'd be curious to know like the deeper psychological reason behind why the gamification i'm wondering if it's maybe just it releases more um serotonin in the brain or if you get like more endorphins through a pleasurable experience that like helps you connect maybe like a a pathway in your brain that helps you remember things better or or build those building blocks you're talking about it's it's really to like um, uh, to to kind of combat this um, this kind of like gradual process, you know that that myelination and like building those pathways. Um, it's just slow, and it can feel you know absolutely brutal at times. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because all you want to do is speed things up and play what you hear in your mind, right. but um, but in order to build those connections, you've kind of got to go a little bit slow. You've got to be a little bit deliberate with it. And so, um, you know, of course, it's very easy to go and do something else that's like more fun um, when, right. when, when it gets tough like that. So the gamification elements are really just designed to overcome um, or just to make it a little bit more enjoyable, that process of just like repetition and grind. You know, you can think of it like grinding in a game, right? The yeah. same... Uh, the same kind of, um, you know, slow progress that like does does happen, but it just takes a long time. And like, it's really about um, regular sort of daily sessions to be able to build up those build up those connections. Yeah. Well, that's. I mean, sorry, I was just going to say, I think that speaks to the product of melodics as well, because you do incorporate a lot of the gamifying of your lessons and um, the different uh, like lessons people can take for growing their skills, like playing keyboard or whatever. Um, and you can like speed up and slow things down too. So like that kind of goes back to what you were saying even earlier. Like I can see now that you're talking about these things that like a lot of this is built into the desktop app melodics that you guys have, such as like speeding up, slowing down while you're playing keys on a certain lesson, um, like getting reward points for getting to a certain point in the game or as you're progressing through lessons. Uh, yeah, like it all makes makes great sense. You know, someday maybe we can all just get Elon Musk's Neuralink and then we can just instantly build all those pathways so we don't even have to think about practicing anymore. It's like, then we'll have to really figure out the next business plan for melodics when we all just think about everything and it happens. <laughs> and there's also like a really good, um, you know, sense of accomplishment and pride, you know, when you like, when you go back and look at like, you know, for instance, something you did like a year ago, two years ago, 10 years ago, and then, and then just thinking back to like, what a, what a challenge that was uh, or yeah. how difficult it seemed. Yeah. And then, you know, when you're playing something now, it's, it's, it's actually kind of like, it's a very, um, uh, it's very confidence building and like uh, it's great sort of positive reinforcement. So I, I really think about like what we do in terms of these two sort of um, main pillars of like guided learning, because uh, obviously we want to you know guide people in their learning of instruments and be not just a game, just be like a, a legit learning tool, but also motivational mechanics, because um, the sort of headwind we're fighting against is that uh, most people who start learning to play an instrument actually just quit. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, you know, the other part of my 
my talk um, uh, planned at Loop. So that was kind of like the science. And the other part is um, more around the art and sort of psychology uh, around practice. And um, that's, that's quite interesting that a lot of this stuff um, comes from a study done by a Hungarian psychologist in the in the 90s called Mihai Csikszent Mihai and sort of what he set out to do he had a very ambitious study he was like um, what makes people happy <laughs> what makes what makes life life worth living I think is how he phrased it and um, he kind of you know is pretty ambitious but yeah. but through the, through the study he kind of concluded um, that people are sort of at their happiest and at their most engaged when they um, are engaged with an activity that perfectly sort of meets um, their ability at that activity with the level of challenge. And he called this flow. You know, when you're in a flow state or a flow channel, it's referred yeah. to. And, you know, this, this idea is kind of like pretty, you know, in the popular um, culture uh, by, by this point, you know. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you've probably experienced being in the flow state, just like writing music, writing beats or yeah. um, playing music or, you know, surfing or coding or reading or writing. There's kind of no limit to these kind of activities. Yeah. And, um, you know, the one characteristic they have to hold common is that, um, you know, your particular ability or your particular skill at that task needs to um, meet uh, meet. The, uh, the level of challenge that that task is giving you at the right um, place for you. So yeah. if you think about, you know, a, a, a graph with challenge and ability on there, uh, you know, if the task you're trying to do is um, too easy for you, you'll just get bored and stop doing it. Yeah. And if it's too hard, you'll just get anxious and and drop out and, and right. stop doing it. And yeah. so there is there is kind of a sweet spot in the in the middle and it changes over time and it's sort of unique to uh to everyone you know like um you know what's flow for me is going to be different than flow for you and you know that's the interesting thing about the model is that it's just unique to everyone and yeah. that's so uh, interesting because uh, most of the producers that i know and that i love that i personally consider really talented have an equal balance or a pretty well balanced mix of being very creative but also very technical uh, especially when using Ableton Live and that kind of speaks to I think balancing that flow state and keeping that going you can match like the level of technicality it, it takes to get the results they want at a faster rate while also being extremely creative in that path yeah yeah and it's it's a model that lends itself really well to like um, developing over time and to, and to learning because um, you know if you consider um, you know this this flow channel uh, as you know as your skill at something increases so should the level of challenge that you that you take on or like technical complexity or like artistic complexity yeah. um you're kind of always wanting to be oscillating around the um top of that flow channel you know it's what i call like the learning edge so you're kind of like pushing yourself into like oh, a little bit of you know over exerting yourself into a little bit of anxiety you know trying to push yourself a bit further because that's that's really where growth happens yeah. Um, you know, experimenting with new uh, techniques or um, taking on new challenges, or new projects that you just put you a bit out of your comfort zone. That sort of thing is, um, you know, I believe like very powerful when you when you link it to a, a model like Flow. Right. Right. And I think having a great teacher is a big part of all that as well. Like, you know, I I could give I could give less of, of a crap about, you know, probability and statistics, but a great probability and statistics teacher in college. So I naturally actually kind of liked the course, like, but in real life, I hate it. I, I thought it was the dumbest class ever, but I had a great teacher who helped me kind of get there. So I think like having somebody or a mentor or whether it's melodic software or something to guide you in that process is like really helpful too. Right. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, at the end of the day, it's stuff that a great, teacher does naturally you know like without even thinking about it yeah. like okay so like what's what's the per, what's what's the right you know piece of music that fits you know like what are you into okay what's the right level of complexity you know how can i push you to like go a bit beyond that it's it is all stuff that like seems like a total no-brainer um but it's actually that like, very complex to execute when you're when you're thinking okay how do i how do i how do we do this at, at scale with like you know thousands of students at once yeah 
yeah and like the whole word edutainment has been like a coin word i think like in the last decade especially with the youtube tutorials like a lot of a lot of like the thriving influencers in like the music education space are a lot of times just really entertaining like it, it might not even be a lot of the concepts that they're teaching are more advanced they're just really entertaining to watch and like just fun to go along with and so people follow them yeah i mean that's you know that's another um that's another tension that i really think about a lot which is this tension between um active and passive learning so active learning just being like learning by doing and passive learning being like you know, learning by being told or watching is that you know active learning works um but students don't like it you know um it's a weird paradox where students learn more but think that they're learning less um so, you know, like a carefully done study that holds, you know, both students and teachers constant um, showed that students learn more in like an active learning class where they're like, you know, making projects and doing things, but they, you know, dislike that style of class and actually think that they're learning less. Um, it's not a big surprise, you know, active learning is hard and it can make students feel like um, they are, um, you know, not doing well. Because yeah. it's much easier to sit back and be entertained by like a great lecturer who makes everything seem simple. Yeah. Um, and so it's like it's 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 you know and and for me you know like I've spent quite a bit of um, time looking into active learning and done like some sort of post grad study in education development around it and it's just it, that paradox is so fascinating you know because we you know at melodics we we very much ride for active learning you know like that's that's what we do we don't have like you know when you open the program it's not like a video of me um you know talking or anything yeah. or like a view of um someone you know demonstrating how to perform a piece of music it just straight away asks you to start you know hitting pads or playing keys or just um just start start musicing yeah and um that approach you know does create a bit of headwind it's not what it's not what people um are necessarily expecting it doesn't you know meet traditional expectations of a classroom and yeah. or like a learning environment in a lot of ways yeah well i think we're seeing and i would love to know more about your thoughts on this but i think we're seeing a big shift in what even the learning environment means or looks like obviously in 2020 with covid i think i mean so many people moved their classes or were forced to online so they had to kind of reestablish an entire new workflow of teaching or uh, even students having to learn from a remote place. And it's interesting. I'm, I think the future really is just online learning in a lot of ways. It really is. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I, of course, I agree that the that future is, is certainly going to be, um, you know, more online would, would, would be the trend. Um, but I think, you know, the interesting thing about that for me is that just in, you know, out, even outside of music and just in terms of wider education, if you think about what that means, it means um, that there's less dependence on a kind of core um, curriculum and sort of a one size fits all model. And it, it allows for like much more differentiation between, um, between students and between the outcomes. And, you know, what I'd like to see is that means that um, individuals can follow their curiosities a lot more and, you um, you know, come out of, of uh, you know, a wider education system with much more differentiated skills. Mm -hmm. Like if you think about, you know, a bunch of high school students going, going to the same school, doing the same classes, you know, they'll largely be getting um, the same outcomes and any differentiation depends on like kind of extracurricular activities, right? Or yeah. like the home, home environment. But if that kind of, um, you know, following your curiosities is, uh, is a bit more encouraged and a bit more enabled by, by online learning, you have the possibility for actually a much more, um, much more differentiated and much more um, interest-led outcomes for uh, the students, which I think is just hugely positive. Yeah. Well, I, I don't remember the exact statistic, but uh, a couple months ago, I was reading about like the growth of trade schools and how like the traditional education system of like, hey, you graduate from high school, it's time to go to college. Like that's that's shifting a lot now and more specialized skills and degrees and trade schools are now like really rising above a lot of traditional universities, at least in the United States. I read an article about that. 
which I thought was really kind of interesting, kind of goes a little bit to what you were saying as well. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, you, you clearly have done a lot with melodics. I, I love the whole ed music education, like psychology side of things. I could probably keep talking about this all day, but I also kind of want to talk about some of the things that you've done. That's pretty cool in the past as well. Talking about your push tutorials. You did one um, show and I can't remember the name of the venue in LA, but that's actually where loop was held in 2019. Um, and it was, I'm pretty sure that's where the performance was. It looked exactly like it on a rooftop. Is that where you performed your underwater set? Or was that a different uh, venue? Cause it looked exactly like it. Oh uh, yeah. Okay. So the um, un underwater was, was, was a piece that I, um, that I had, had written uh, in 2012, I want to say. Yeah, it's been a while. Um, yeah, written, written with um, with a with a pedal steel guitarist. Um, so it's kind of like it's a bit, bit of bit of a shared um, composition. And I I took that piece like a year or so later, and I adapted it to be able to perform on the Push One. Just just around the time the Push Push One was coming out, I was living in Berlin, and um, I so you tried. didn't you didn't perform that in LA then because it looked exactly like another venue on a rooftop. Oh, and the, the, the performance was like in in this um it's in a in a nightclub called Humboldtheim uh, in uh, sort of north east Berlin. Okay, but it was during during the day, so it was like the kind of outdoor zone, chill zone, but like during the day for the for the shoot. Okay. Okay. On a rooftop, but it kind of has like rooftop sort of vibes. Yeah. Um, it looked exactly like the place where Loop 2019 was held on a rooftop, and that's why I thought I was there before. But never mind. Just kidding. Anyway, but yeah, it was a really cool video. And could you talk a little bit about how you set up? Um, obviously, in a perfect world, we would just screen share and you'd walk us through that. There's a really great tutorial on Ableton's website about how you did this as well. But like, I thought it was a really fascinating process how you took this steel guitar basically just kind of sampled it and played it back on the push like the recording yeah i just i just one of the things that i noticed about the design of the of the push one straight away which i really liked was the huge um modulation strip down the side i just thought they made for like a really cool performative interface and my just absolute first gut instinct idea was to utilize that in some way for the for the performance and then I was just looking through like the bits of, you know, I was like, well, should I, you know, write a piece of music just for this? Or should I just find something that I've done before that I can try and adapt? And then, you know, that with the, with the pedal steel kind of um, clicked immediately. It actually didn't really take that much time. I just recorded a, a single guitar note and, um, and then, you know, mapped the, uh, mapped the pitch bend to this, uh, to this modulation strip. Yeah. Um, and you and you put that sample in a sampler, right? In one of the zones, and then you're able to play that back at different notes. Yeah, exactly. I'm a, I'm a, I, I'm I'm probably not like a, a very sophisticated live user, but um, there's a few devices like Sampler which I just think are fantastically done, um, and I I know I know them pretty well. Um, so I think almost everything in that piece would have been using sampler in, in, in some way. Um, the synthesis parts, I think I used uh, the push to control uh, you know. a, a, a Juno synth just through like an external instrument. Um, beautiful synth, by the way. Yeah, yeah, it was cool. I mean, I, I borrowed that whole setup of a friend of mine, um, uh, the sort of Space Echo and the Juno and stuff yeah. like that just, that, just for that performance. Yeah. Yeah, you had an interesting way of routing it too, because I imagine you're using an external audio effect to run uh, the signal of the guitar out of your audio interface into the space echo and then back into your interface. Is that right? Um, yeah, I think I just had an external audio effect on one of the um, send channels. Mm -hmm. And so I could, I could run uh, you know, everything out at varying degrees into that, into that space echo and then you know, that's just a kind of like a, a very certain sound um, and you can kind of play it manually a bit and dial, dial in timing and stuff. Yeah, no, that's smart to use a return track with uh, external audio. 
and then you can send any track you want to it. That's yeah, it's brilliant. Love that. I'm actually going to yeah. feel that and start doing that too. That's cool. Cause you can like, you know, set up two of them and play feedback and like send them, send them to each other and stuff as well. Um, so it certainly works well with stuff like a tape echo or like an old reverb. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever done much like reamping that way with that same routing technique? Yeah. 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 I'm, 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 uh, big fan of um like pretty uh simple um you know sort of uh mix and dynamics chains and i don't really put a lot of effort into that stuff but i do really like doing stuff like sending audio in and out of places and like reamping and trying to find uh, interesting combinations that way rather than spending heaps of time on like what I'd, what I'd call sort of like post post production. I tend to get bored pretty quickly doing post production, but if I can like, you know, find interesting stuff during like the production stage, I'm a lot more engaged in it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Staying inspired, having good sounds from the beginning is going to go a long way. Yeah. Your underwater track was really cool. It was a great vibe. It was an old song, but like I was watching that on repeat today. I was enjoying it. It was a great performance. Anybody listening right now, I'm going to include a link in the show notes. You guys can go watch that too. If you haven't seen it already. There is one, one other um, one I did for Ableton after that um, with, I was, I was producing a, um, a, a jazz project for um, the blue note for a pianist called Aaron Ottenion and uh with a steel pan drummer called sam dubois and we were we were playing like as a as a, as a trio and uh performing aaron's compositions and trying to um come up with like a uh, you know like an interesting um sound for these jazz compositions and so we ended up doing a, you know like jazz trio pretty tr- pretty traditional sort of setup but we instead of um you know drums bass and piano we uh went with uh, electronics which I was you know doing like rhythm section stuff but I, I'll come back to that so piano Aaron was playing piano and also playing a lot of the bass um with his with his feet like a like an organ and cool. Sam was playing a steel pan in percussion um so this was like as you can imagine like very attacky very sort of um very uh, percussive uh kind of music yeah and uh, the other thing that I would set up is, um, and this is sort of the next thing I did with the push after Underwater, was looking at using the, the Robert Henke um, granulator device to yeah. do live granular synthesis of this, you know, piano and steel pan, so we could kind of improvise and cool. um, and and riff on each other with the with these kind of songs. Yeah. Um, and so we we ended up doing, uh, and you can find this on like the Ableton uh, blog or the website. We ended up doing a um, live recording in the in the Funk House in Berlin, and um, ended up doing a little short film walking through some of the ideas that were around, um, you know, using using push and live in the context of like live improvisation with other musicians and stuff. And a lot of these ideas are actually like pretty developed now and like it's a lot more common, but at the time I remember just talking to a lot of people and uh, having to, having to really hunt around for some inspiration and ideas about how to actually set this all, set all this stuff up. This is cool. Yeah. Yeah. Is that, is that called waterfalls? Waterfalls is, is one of the that was yeah. that was yeah, one yeah. of the songs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm looking yeah. at it right now. I'll include a link in the show notes for this video as well for anybody that wants to watch it. But yeah, this looks really cool. It's a beautiful stage. It's, it's like a it's a cool little intimate venue. I like it. Yeah, your hair was a lot longer back then. Yeah, it just gets <laughs> gets shorter as I get older. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's how it goes. Um, cool, man. Yeah, I mean. So right now, what what's the latest and greatest that you're working on uh, related to melodics or just even your own personal projects right now? Uh, well, you know, I've got two young kids. And so latest and greatest is really uh, working on, you know, raising them in amongst a kind of crazy, uh, you know, COVID pandemic and lockdowns and uh, trying, to, trying to keep the family chill. Um, so that's really taking a lot of my time. Uh, what I'm, with, with my own music practice, uh, 
I actually just kind of haven't hit record in, in a couple of years, which is, uh, you know, not great, but also means it um, takes a lot of the uh, kind of weight and pressure of um, having to like, every time I, you know, do, do some music, a lot of my career I was involved in like, you know, producing music. So like making, you know, a musical product at the end of it. And um, if I just don't hit record, um, there's none of that expectation. So it's a, it's a lot of kind of, um, you know, I'll just like sit down and like learn a piece on the piano or, um, you know, jam around on some synths or make a beat, like little 10, 15 minute bursts here and there where I can. Uh, but I haven't done any really um, serious music projects for a while, which I'm keen to get back into it, to be honest, I think, you know. Yeah, yeah, you should. You make it's great. Is, is long enough i've got nothing against recording i just uh, i just have, have been you know using music more as a, as a way to um to relax yeah uh, yeah well it's therapy really I, I i think of making music for myself as a form of self-care really especially in these last 12 months just being able to take time just to empty my brain whether i finish it or not a lot of time it's just making it for me but yeah I mean, I, you make great music. I've loved all the stuff you've released. I've listened to a lot of it. Um, it hasn't released anything for a while, but if you ever get around to it, definitely let me know. Send me a link. I, will. I mean, the thing, the thing that I actually really miss about it is that most of the projects I do, it's not sort of, um, you know, my name on the, on, the, on the front of the record. It's, it's much more um, collaborative. And that's actually the thing I really miss, just like meeting a bunch of new people, um, getting an insight into um, into you know their musical world, what yeah. they're into, and um, bringing that you know those learnings into my own practice. Um, and so you know, if anything will pull me back in, it's just like working with some cool people to make something interesting that I just haven't done before. Sure. Just frankly, just sit, sitting around by myself um, doing stuff that I've done before is just not you know I find it relaxing, but it's not like interesting enough for me to like want to dive headfirst into a project. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you have all these other ideas that kind of bounce off of you that you would never think of otherwise when you collaborate with people. Who are some of the favorite people that you've worked with in the past? Uh, well, you know, so, certainly um, anything I, I haven't sort of done before um, is, is going to be is going to be pretty interesting. So uh, one of the projects I've really enjoyed recently was working with um, a friend of mine, Florian, uh, who is a composer um, and producer based in based in Berlin and him and I wound up um, making an entire film score together for a, a documentary film and it was like it was pretty pretty crazy like sort of uh, premise it's like kind of investigative journalism looking at um, competitive tickling which um, <laughs> wow. I mean, you can you definitely leave this one in the show notes because this is, this is weird as hell and it's kind of funny I love that the movie came out and it's called Tickled and it is like, it's a wild, wild ride. Um, I need to watch this tonight. Tickled. It is like, is this a documentary or based on a true story? Like what is oh, this is all like hundred percent for real, but it feels, for real. It, feels, it feels like it is completely. Um, <laughs> like, it's amazing. Uh, so like these, these are professional ticklers. Like these people are very competitive about like their tickling game. This is a thing. Uh, I don't want to. I don't. I don't want to go um, super deep, but it's basically like it's um, it's it's a really interesting tale of like kind of um, power dynamics, really, um, uh, and and manipulation and uh, yeah. <laughs> that's that's amazing. I don't know how to how to explain it properly? <laughs> but anyhow, like Flo and I, um, you know. Uh, wound up working on this stuff and and you know did did these cues um in like a, a very short amount of time probably in like a, a, a week or two um and that was cool because a lot of it's like very sort of like guitar music and like flow's background is like as a, as a rock producer like more from like rock and like metal sort of background yeah. and you know for me that was like all new and i'm like hey you know check out this granular synthesis stuff and he's like wow that's cool that that kind of like um fit, fits in with uh with uh, where we can take this yeah. so we've got to use, use um you know bring together a lot of our individual um sort of experiences to like in in the service of something that was like a little bit of like an interesting narrative you know something that's like starts out very kind of like weird and 
quirky and funny turns like pretty sinister there's a lot of like kind of ups and downs in the plot arc and how you kind of like map that emotionally with music was like a really cool challenge yeah i'm sure it would be yeah that's the thing that's really fun about like scoring for film and the couple projects that i've done mostly for like commercials or just for like little things or small short films it's just like i love that challenge of like okay here's the vision find what's going to set the mood for that you know like it's definitely a challenge and i'm sure you know better than i do but but that's a whole different world of producing like just scoring and composing for video or some visual component i think that's yeah it's, that's pretty cool i'm i'm looking at this on wikipedia right now i'm going to check out this tickled film <laughs> this looks amazing actually i just started reading some of the synopsis it's hilarious i love it um looks like the film did pretty well too yeah 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 i mean it's like it's a, it's a wild ride it's a crazy film yeah that's <laughs> competitive tickling yeah yeah it's, it's yeah maybe i don't know i would love to go to like a competitive tickling match like do they actually have like like arenas where they have like crowds that like cheer on people or is oh, it okay. it's it's much more of a scam than a real thing oh. um I'm just picturing it's like the Super Bowl or World Cup, you know, it's like these two guys just tickling each other. No, it's just so funny. Uh, anyway. you tell me what you think. <laughs> no, I definitely will. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, yeah, man. Well, where's the best place for people to stay connected with you or if they want to continue to follow the work you're doing? Um, well, <laughs> You know, like like you said, I'm I'm not super active on social media at the moment. Um, right. you can find me on Twitter at, at Roddy Kirk um, is probably is probably the best best place. Um, yeah. uh, I'll you know occasionally do do some do some talking about the work I'm doing at Melodics on the Melodics blog as well. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah. Um, awesome. No, thanks, man, for for hanging out and sharing all this this wisdom with us. I appreciate your time. Uh, yeah, last but not least, I, you know, I want to respect your time. I know you've got stuff to do, but I guess, well, what's the next thing for Melodics? Like, what are the upcoming projects that you're working on or things you're excited about? Well, um, the things the things that I'm really excited about are stuff like, um, you know, what I talked about with, uh, you know, flow and uh, motivational mechanics is um, keeping on trying to... Um, you know, like incorporate those ideas um, and they're quite abstract ideas and quite difficult sort of engineering challenges to, to, to build those in. Um, and so I find that work really interesting. We also, um, of course, want to support like more and more types of music. Um, you know, I really strongly believe that um, if you see, uh, you know, that the, the type of music that you're into, um, you know, sort of represented in the start of your musical learning journey, you're a lot more likely to stick with it than if you like playing Three Blind Mice or something like that. Yeah. Um, Still a great you know, song. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you can, yeah, I mean, you can, but you can, you know, for instance, you can do that song a lot of different ways, you know. Um, right. And yeah, so stuff like that really, really, um, excites me i really um am into the idea of taking um pads very seriously as a as a musical instrument so finger drumming and pads i believe um you know could actually be something you know that uh you know replaces the xylophone or something as like a um as a you know first musical instrument for 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 people I think the fact that you can um, that you that it's very modular and that you can you know adjust you know what what samples um, are on there or how they're sort of played, the fact that you're just immediately able to make um, cool sounding noises, uh, the fact that you're able to like develop these sort of core fundamental skills such as like you know timing and listening. Um, I find that all really powerful and I still think there's a really, really long way to go um, for that instrument. I believe in it really strongly. And so we're of course going to support other instruments like we're teaching drums and keys um, at Melodics, but I have always been the most interested in pads. 
Yeah. And like, I'd like to see that develop like a lot further. And, you know, there's not, um, you know, like with, with something like keys or piano, you know, there's, um, you know, a thousand years of like uh, pedagogy and like sort of um, built up, built up knowledge there. Whereas, um, you know, for something like pads and finger drumming, you know, of course there is a bit from, from, you know, drumming and from percussion, but considering, um, you know, that instrument from like, you know, an MPC and like early hip hop stuff is really not, 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 not a huge amount of history there. I mean, the history is super interesting, but I think it's got a really, really long way to go. And there's, you know, we're working with, um, some partners like the Berkeley College of Music, um, they have a they have a program there um, on digital instruments, and that's um, being run by uh, Daedalus. Uh, and he's he you know he's got students that are um, that their major sort of performance uh, instrument is um, is a pad controller, and I just find that super cool and interesting. And you know, chatting with him about um, you know what the challenges are and like. Um, what uh, sort of he sees as, as interesting directions for, for going there, I find really cool. So yeah, um, future plans for melodics is to is to keep keep doing what we're doing, but um, really not not forgetting uh, where we've come from with the um, with the electronic music community sure. and with um, the music tech world, especially with stuff like um, push and pad controllers. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm excited to see what you guys do in the near future and just electronic music technology in general. I mean, you think about it, the first push came out. Um, it looks like you could pre-order it March 5th of 2013. That's not that long ago. It's not long ago. It's really right? not that long ago. I mean, we've got a long way ahead of us. It's going to be wild to see 10 years from now what's coming out. I don't think we even have any idea yet. Like there can, the average consumer, I don't think, has any idea like what pads or MIDI controllers are going to look like in the next decade. It's going to be some next level, I think, with MPE and MIDI 2.0. It's going to be a lot of options. It's going to be pretty exciting. Yeah, I'm here for it. It's a yeah. wild, wild ride. Same here, man. Well, it's good talking to you. Appreciate you joining the podcast, Rowdy. And um, yeah, maybe we'll have you back again sometime. And I appreciate what you and Melodics are doing, making the world a better place. I appreciate, I appreciate all that. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dan. Yeah. Take care. If you haven't checked out Melodics yet, go to Melodics.com, check out the free trial. Also, if you decide to purchase their subscription plan, save some money by using the discount code LPO-20, LPO-20, and save yourself some money. Check it out. Also, I encourage you to join the newsletter, and you'll get the latest updates with new episodes and other happenings, and Ableton Live trainings, other things. Go to liveproducersonline.com slash newsletter, and you can join that way and subscribe and stay connected. And if you haven't purchased the latest version of Ableton Live, save some money, get a discount, go to liveproducersonline.com slash buy Ableton, and I would glad to hook you up with purchasing Ableton Live. And you'll get a free upgrade to Live 11 when it comes out soon. Thanks again for listening, everybody, and we'll see you next time.